Somebody out there goes to the grand and can hear this thing. Wow. With all that said, we have everyone stay. Lots of it. Somebody else can't be too great. I don't think that any legs broke and stuff. You know? I'm you all glad to be here. I am so glad I didn't work in here today. But how many of y'all came in and actually seen some of the changes we've been making? If you get a chance, walk around. We got a new coat of paint on the part of the sanctuary. The kitchen's been changed. We're working on some of this out here. The fellowship area's been painted. Check it out. This is this is the ties and offerings. All of goes back into the church and everything that we're doing. So I mean, you know, please take ownership and check it out. We got some uh, new young ladies here checking out the church. Checking out for Mamaw Rosie. So see them, shake their hands, hug their necks. Let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this awesome day. Lord, I thank you for each and every individual here tonight. Lord, I give you praise and glory and honor. Lord, and I just ask you to be with us during the remaining part of our service. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Now, everybody, the rain has been awesome. For those of you that attend, make some church of God.
I had something planned for tonight, and the person with whom I had planned it is not here. Therefore, I don't have anything prepared for tonight after all. So, so I'm going to let Kathy. No, no, that won't work either, actually. So, actually, uh, we, we have something else in mind that I'm going to do. Uh, as you all know, we're always up here talking about timing. That's probably one of the things we talk about the most, actually. We read a lot of scripture. We uh, tell you what God has said in terms of tithing and so on. Those are all great scriptures. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But one of the things that people usually don't do enough of in church, we don't tell you enough about what goes on at home sometimes. We all know what we're like here standing in the church, sitting in the pew. But what's it like at home sometimes? Well, you know, an awful lot of us probably have heard this story from you before, but I have to start somewhere, so we're going to back up for just a second. We've had a lot of, since I retired, I've been retired a little over four years now. I have less money now than I have ever had in my life, and I'm really not used to that even after four years. Plus, I haven't gotten used to being pretty much broke all the time. And one of the reasons we're broke all the time is I tried really well to plan this out ahead of time, and I did a really good job of figuring everything out. But one thing I didn't, Marcus, was what they call unexpected expense. Now, that doesn't sound too complicated, unexpected expense. But the thing is, I have unexpected expense every month. 
And it's usually a lot. So one of the things I realized is maybe unexpected expense is missing. Maybe it should be expected expense at this point because it's been going on for over four years. And all about three months, we've had some kind of disaster every single month that I've been with. Uh, it's either me at the doctor or me in the hospital, the dog's meetings, something at the vet. Uh, Appliance is breaking down, the furnace goes out. You know, anywhere from hundreds to thousands of dollars. It's incredible how much money I've spent since I haven't had it. Now, you might think, well, that's kind of silly. I want, Kathy, I want you to do the one thing that I called you up here for now. How much money do you see? I just took it out of my pocket. I'm sure you all saw that. Four dollars. Thank God for the four dollars. That's, that's what I'm going to talk about. Because, see, this is the last night of the month. And we've already had our usual monthly disaster this month. And the monthly disaster this month cost us about 400 bucks. Now, the thing is... On a good month where we don't have any disasters, if that ever actually would happen, uh, we don't run $400 at the end of the month to the good. That actually doesn't happen. So you have to understand that paying an extra $400, that's more money than we have. But just like last month and all the other months, I don't come up here and tell you this every month because I don't. you don't need to hear my sob stories. But the thing of it is, after another month of it this month and paying out 400 bucks that we actually don't have, Tonight's the last night of the month, and we still have $4. Now, $4 isn't much, and most people probably say, I don't know you to do, that if you'll tithe, if you'll give first fruits like you're supposed to, and some of you do and some of you don't, but I, I keep telling you that if you do, he'll bless you. Now, you think, well, he ain't blessed you much, dude. You got 4 bucks. Yes, he has, because like I just got done running through a list of things here. I have something happen to me every single month almost. And if you think I'm not blessed to have two, three, four, eight, whatever dollars at the end of the month, I think I'm doing pretty good because, see, I could be hundreds or even thousands of dollars in debt because I've had things go wrong that cost me as much as three and four thousand dollars. How do you come up with that when you don't even have three hundred? But every single bill is paid, folks. None of them were paid late. They were all paid on time, every single one of them. And I still got the four dollars. <laughs> Yeah, Kathy's actually got it now, apparently. I don't know if I'll get it back. But, but still, there, there is $4 left. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, you might think a lot of times it, it's a perspective thing. You might sit there and say, well, God's not blessing you so good because you'd like to be having hundreds of extra dollars to spend. Hey, so would I. You know, maybe one of these months it'll actually happen. You know, I'm looking forward to that. But if it doesn't, as long as there's 4 bucks left, God's more than met my needs. I'm 4 bucks more than I need to be. I'm rich. You know, he could take four more bucks, and I'd still be fine. So that's no problem. So, you know, the thing of it is, it's not, you know, where you sit there and say, oh, woe is me. It just keeps happening. When's it going to stop? I don't know when it's going to stop, but as long as he's paying the bills, which he has every month, I'm not going to worry about it. Amen? It's time for us to take up our tithes and offerings and have the ushers come forward, please. Nancy, I'd like you to pray over the offering tonight, if you would, please. Amen. Because you can 
Isn't it good to be in God's house tonight? Amen. Amen. I just want to stand up here just a moment and let everybody know that Nancy did not break my rib. Uh, contrary to rumors that are going around. <laughs> yeah, we were, um, as you all know, we, uh, we got to Colorado every summer and minister out there. And we were, it, we had a wonderful time. The Lord really moved uh, while we were out there. And um one, uh, the last Sunday that I was there, the uh, pastor at uh, the Wesleyan church we were at, you know, uh, asked, you know, about uh, doing the young people service that night, that evening, I should say. And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And so uh, we decided to go out and toss around some football before we had the, uh, the lesson. And I found out the ground out in Colorado is very hard. Uh, because I hit something or tripped on something, and I went down and felt something. But then I got up and played football for another hour and uh, taught the lesson, you know. And we got in the car to head over to grab a bite to eat. And when we got over there, I'm like, something's not right. It hurts. And it wasn't until we got home that I found out I had a broken rib. And then a few days later, I found out I had a bruised diaphragm. So... You know, it's uh, but uh, that's why you've not been hearing me sing a whole lot up here. That's why it hurts to play and it hurts to sing and, and all that. But, you know, I'm still going to give it a shot, you know, because I believe God can do great and mighty things. And I believe God can reach down and say, rib be healed. I mean, if, if he took a rib and created a woman, 
right? He, he knows how to put it all back together. And, uh, and so I am thankful, you know, to be here tonight. And like I said, uh, thankful to what God did while we were out there. We, Nancy and I, we sat with a couple of pastors out there, heard some great, great testimonies from them that actually encouraged, you know, I don't know, if, I guess it encouraged Nancy, it encouraged me to hear what God had done for them. And, you know, we need to let people know what God has done for us. You know, that, that, that we need to let, because the world out there, all they hear is the garbage that's on the news. And they need to hear some good news about what Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us. If you haven't shared your testimony with somebody recently, I encourage you, do it. Do it. Because you never know what soul you might win by sharing what God has done for you. Amen? Amen. Ask Gene to come on up and sing for us. And Brother Paul, you never know who's watching you, and you might find out about it 15, 20 years later. That happened to me, the little girl I work with. She told Our Lady, she says, you know, she says, I remember when I was a little girl, Miss Jeannie would shout, and she would smile, and she said, I loved her so much. But she said, you know what I like the best about her? She wore all those pretty colored shoes. And she said, and you know, said she could sing. Said, I like to hear her sing. I forgot all about my colored shoes. <laughs> but you never know who's watching you. Amen. Go ahead. Country where no twilight shadows deepen an ending day where night will never be a city where no storm clouds ever gather oh this is just what heaven means to me what joy it'll be when we get over yonder and we join the throng around the glassy What heaven means to me And when at last we see The face of Jesus Before whose image Other loved ones flee And when they crown him Lord of all, I'll be there. This is just what heaven means to me. What joy it'll be when we Yes, this is just 
what heaven means to me. Thank you. Bless you. We just come from my sister's father-in-law's funeral today. And Lonnie's best fishing buddy, Gary Laswell's funeral is Saturday. Keep the Overman family in your prayers and keep Lonnie's friends, the Laswell family, in your prayers. Thank you. All right, Children's Church, quietly, quietly walk on out. Dave, you ready? Come on up. You know, Satan has to go before the Lord before he gets a chance to come toward us. You know, we'll come out of the house tonight. I'm standing at the foot of the steps reading the mail. Charlotte comes down the steps. I reached for my keys. I don't have no keys. I looked at her and said, you got keys? She said, no. There we are, keyless. So I had to resort back on my previous training. I had to break into my own house. <laughs> Charlotte was going to help me. We got this balcony out front, right our fence. She started climbing up, and she got about that far off the ground. <laughs> she said, I can't go no farther. So I go get my, my extension ladder. I get up, two stories, I get up there and I climb through the window, get the window up, everything, and I start through. And I realized that I had that dumb lat disease. My belly done lapped over my belly, my belt. <laughs> so when I went through the window, I lost my balance. <laughs> Head first. <laughs> I don't know what I've knocked in the floor. <laughs> I don't know what I upset. But you know what? I know what came out of my mouth. It wasn't one of them dirty words. You know what? Satan can only do what the Lord allows him to do. The Lord said, if you go, he said, I'm already going to show you what my son and my daughter is going to do. You know, get ready for that butt weapon because they're fixing to put it on you. You know, that's what he told Job. You know, he said, you know, have you considered my perfect boy, Job? You know what? We could put our name where Job's name is there. You know, God's got that much faith in us. Amen. You know, a couple, three weeks ago, or maybe a month ago, I told you that I wrecked a car. I want to keep black of Satan's eyes. Is that okay? Wrecked my car. Knocked the nose off of it. First thing I do is get out and make sure everybody's okay and praise the Lord for that. Been paying insurance on my car, taxes on my car for $3,200. I get a check the other day. I get a check for $6,800. Double what I owed. Insurance company told me, said it's going to take $6,100 to fix my car. Lord, give me 68. Why did he give me 68? Because he knows that I was going to be faithful paying my tithes. Wrote a check for $680. You know what? I ain't standing here to brag on me because I couldn't use that money. But you know what? I do use that money. I give it to the Lord and the Lord gives it back. How does he give it back to me? You know, in the fellowship that we had, building that wall, tearing that wall down, the good, the good people that we got to fellowship with to know, get to know who our sisters and brothers are. He said, together, together. You know, it don't make no difference how we gather together if it's building a wall sitting around the table or in his church house. He said, we, we have to gather together. That's the way we get to learn each other. That's how we get to know, learn how to pray for each other. You know that? We, we come to church and we beat the door down getting into church and beat the door down getting back out of church and we don't do nothing with it. We might as well stay home. We might as well stay home. He said to take it outside of these four walls. I don't care how big or how wide the wall is. He said you take it out there. If you would, stand for the reading of the word, please. It's going to be Matthew twenty two fourteen. It's a familiar scripture. It's a familiar message. But the Lord's given it to me in a different way. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. He calls so many of us, and we don't respond. The name of the service tonight is 
two pregnant women, a murderer, a thief, and you. Let's go before the Lord with prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity, Lord, to be in your house of worship, Father. We thank you for all the blessings that you've bestowed up us to this point, Lord. We're going to thank you for the blessings this day forward, Father. We invite you into your house, Lord. Lord God, I ask that you anoint my lips, Lord, that you open my eyes, that you open my heart, Lord, that you give it, let me give it the way you give it to me. Lord Jesus, in your name, I pray. I just went through and found some of the scripture where the Bible talks about where we're calling. But the first, number one, above any calling that he puts on his heart is John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. First of all, we had to accept that calling right there. No man. I could get out and do all I want to do. But if God's not working through me, I can't do nothing. I can't lead you to the Lord if he's not calling you. We have to be called. We have to understand. We have to see that calling right off the bat. That, above everything else, that's the first calling that we have to meet. Matthew 9, 37, 38. The harvest truly is plenty, but the laborers are few. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. John 15, 19. Because you are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Isaiah 41, 9, 10. Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. You know, the Lord, from day one, he's been calling to us. He said that he knew us way back before creation. He already had a plan for each and every one of us. He's already ordained what we're going to do. You know, all we have to do is be the conduit and let him work. He's already set up. All we got to do is show up. So many times we get in the way and we want to let ourselves be, be known to, you know, get out there and take that name and put our name before the Lord. Too many times we put our footsteps before Jesus. We get so caught up in ourselves. We make it all about us. We can see it every time we turn the TV on. We can see it when we get somebody out there that's doing that chest beating. Look what I've done. You know what? The Bible says that we can't do nothing except it's through him. Nothing at all. We can't even take a breath without him. Ain't nobody in here with a lung machine, so ain't no lung machines and no air machines, you know, breathing for us. You know, that all comes straight from the Lord and only from the Lord. You know, the, the first pregnant woman that I want to talk about is Sarah and, and we know the story you know we've heard it so many times but we kind of forget to read in the in the back lines kind of forget how did it get that far why was Sarah picked why was Abraham picked there's a reason that they was picked why was Abraham so important in God's eyes because wherever Abraham went Above everything else, he would build an altar for the Lord. Above everything else, above family, above livestock, above everything else, every time that he pitched his tent, he built an altar and invited the Lord into his camp. We forget that sometimes. We want to run home and slam the door. We've been in church. We're tired. We give God an hour and a half, and we're tired. We forget to take them home with us. We don't step up and do our part. When that lady took the nose of that car off, praise God that I had enough God in me that, that I got out to make sure that nobody was hurt, and then I give him praise and I give him thanks. Oh, he didn't have nothing to do with that. He had everything to do with that, just like he did with Abraham. He already set Abraham's life up for him before Abraham even got the promise that he was going to father a child. The Bible says Sarah was 90 years old. So when she got the message, she laughed. And then the Lord called her on it. Well, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. But you've got to be crazy. I'm 90 years old. 
how in the world can I, I, I have a child at 90 years old? And on top of that, my husband is 10 years older than me. What's that make him? If I'm 90, what's that make him? 90 years old, that makes him a stud. The Bible says he fathered a couple other childs, didn't he? Abraham was already laid out. He was already called by God way back when. After he already went out to the Canaan land, was that when he was, he, he was called? No, he was called back before the creation. How does God know what to do, who to call, whatever? He said he looks out of the heart. You know, when we was in our mother's womb, before we was in our mother's womb, he already knew us. So he knows he, the ones that was going to sit up on the pews tonight. I heard a pastor one time said, boy, I had this, or not, maybe not a pastor, but a preacher. He said, I had this message all picked out. Boy, it was a good message. But the people it was for, they didn't show up. I've never got up here and preached a message that was in me. Every message that I preached, the Lord give me. I don't want to preach in me. I ask the Lord all the time, Lord, if I ever make it about me, I want you to chop my legs off. I want me to fall flat out of my face. I don't want to make it about me. So Abraham, you know, he's 90 years old. Well, not 100 years old. Sarah's 90. And they, and they have a child. And why did they have that particular child? Because God said that they was going to have that particular child. Wasn't it that, that he was just going to give him a child and leave it at that? But he gave him Isaac. Could give him any child. You know, could have went down a nurse and went, went down that sperm bank and just picked out anything and said, here it is, you're on your own. But he already had Isaac picked out too. All the wonderful things that Isaac done. All the way down, on, on, on down through the, the, the Bible, you know. We go through some of the begots. Abraham begot Isaac. Solomon begot Boaz. Asa begot Josaphat. And it goes down to one of the most important. And Jacob begot Joseph. The husband of the second pregnant woman. We'll hear about Joseph. Joseph gets called up in that manly thing. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. You're pregnant by somebody else, so I'm going I'm to get away from you. He got inside of himself. Lord sent that angel, sat him down, had that conversation with him. Even though it was in his sleep. He said, you need to step up and you need to listen to what I'm trying to tell you. We hear a lot about what Joseph did, but we never hear about Mary. I don't see any word that I could find that would give Mary's age other than a young maiden. Most important thing that stuck out that she was a virgin. It'd probably be hard for the Lord to find a young virgin nowadays. They're still there, but they're hard to find. But they come to her and said, you know what? She said, you're going to be pregnated by the Holy Ghost. Who's the Holy Ghost? What's the Holy Ghost? If, unless she's had any kind of a, a church upbringing, she had no idea what was going on. She's going to be impregnated by somebody she probably didn't really know a whole lot about. It wasn't like virgins was being impregnated all over the neighborhood that it was an everyday occurrence. So that little girl, she was probably scared out of her mind. Probably didn't know really what to expect. Mothers nowadays, they don't want to even have that conversation with their daughters to set them up and let them know what to expect, what's coming around the corner. I get so sick and tired when I see 13 to 14 year old girls pregnant. They got all their education on the street. That's another generational curse. A lot of times their mother was the same way. 
a generational curse. Generational curses just ain't back in the Old Testament. We got drugs. That's a generational curse. We got alcoholism. That's a generational curse. We can break that curse any time that we want to. All we have to do is call on the name of Jesus. We can't do it by ourselves. There's no way, there's no program, there's no organization out there that's going to get you off of it. They can hinder you a lot. Hinder you a lot. I'm a recovering alcoholic. You come to these meetings and we're going to teach you how not to drink. The Lord's the only one that took that desire away from me. Amen. You know, without him, I'd be in prison or I'd be in the grave. I have no doubt about that. So many times, you know, everybody else, and you know, we're talking about this stuff over, over in Russia and stuff. Oh, man, that's just going to happen. Talk about the weather. Oh, that's just Mother Nature. She's upset. I was talking to a guy building a house across the street from me yesterday. You want to get rid of your neighbors out of your yard? Start talking about Jesus. Amen. Start talking about Jesus, sir, leave. Not that I wanted him to leave. I wanted them to hear about this man called Jesus, the man that tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, I love you so much. Do you know what? When you start talking about Jesus, they run. And they run fast sometimes. And that's what we're talking about tonight, running so fast away from your calling. I don't know what my calling is. You need to spend more time on your knees. You need to be, spend more time in the, in the Word of God, you know. God's calling. I mean, he's laid it all out right here in just the scriptures that I read. You know, he, when, when Sarah got the message, you know, she laughed. She laughed. She, she thought it was funny. And God had to remind her. Can I do everything? Can I do everything? So why would you even doubt this? You know, they talk about this, this couple, you know, only being right at the 100-year mark. But the Bible talks about them being 800, 900 years old. I'm 61, man. I, I don't think I could last another 10 years. This body is beat up. You know, put that wall up. Senior citizens, boy, we've done a good job. And some of the guys was trying to be a senior citizens, they'll get there. <laughs> but we've done a good job. You know, why did we do a good job? Because we love each other to start with. We love the task that the Lord put before us. And everything might not be perfect. But oh well. If you wanted the perfect, you should have been her. The blessings that you missed out on. The blessings that you missed out on. I was sitting on the front row here one night. The Lord told me to run. I shot out like a bullet. Scared a lot of the church people. I come out of the seat. Jerome said I pushed off his knee when I come out. That's how much force I come out of the seat with. After I got three running, I come back and sit down next to the brother. Brother said, you stole my blessing. I said, how did I steal your blessing? He said, you run. I said, I didn't steal your blessing. I got my blessing. You missed out on yours because you didn't run. We got our blessing. You missed out on yours. You know, Mary answered that call. She allowed herself to be pregnant. It's already predestined. All she had to do is show up. The Lord does all the hard work, right? He does all the hard work. All he says is just show up. The Lord's moving me up the ladder. I have that doubt too. I get scared. He told me just a couple weeks ago, he said, you think I'd have called you and not prepared you? We get so caught up in our flesh. I'm scared to death where the Lord's taking me. But I know he's already got the way prepared for me. Amen. Does that mean I, I want to fight and hold back a little bit? Yeah, because I don't know what to expect. But I know what his promise is, that he's already prepared the way for me. All I got to do is show up. So many times, you know, that's what, that's what the biggest thing is. Well, we don't know what to do, that we're brought up and, and, and you know, we just ain't right or we don't speak right. And, and that brings us to the next guy that I want to talk about. 
I want to talk about how he got started. If you remember, he got started with a death warrant on his head. As a little bitty boy, he had a death. Old King said, go out and kill all the boys. Kill them all. Make sure they're all dead. Mother hid the little baby out for a few months. And she got where she didn't think that she could hide them out anymore. So she knew the old princess was coming down to the waterways to take a bath every day. So we built this little ark for this little baby. Sends them down the stream. Princess is there. She sees the ark. She runs over. You know, an ark's a boat with a roof over it. She runs over. Pulls the lid back. And the little baby starts crying. Instantly, she falls in love with him. And just to show you how good the Lord orchestrates things, all you have to do is just show up. He knew the prince was going to be there. He knew the mother was going to put the baby in the water that day. He knew that the little, little baby sister was going to run up to the princess and say, Hey, let me help you out with that. He said, I know that you need a maiden to raise that baby for you. He said, I know just a woman. The princess says, Let's go, go get her. Brought her back. It was the baby's mother. So the baby's, she's raised up and finally gets to come home and live with the princess. And the princess raises this kid up as her own. And the princess calls him by name, Moses. Lord already ordained all of it. All the princess had to do was just show up. She did. The sister did. The mother did. Moses stays in the Pharaoh's camp, and he's raised as a prince. All the fine clothes, all the fine food, all the fine training, all the fine education for 40 years. He had everything. And he kept looking at the abuse that his people was getting. Finally, one day, he couldn't take it no more. So he killed a guard. One of the king's guards he killed. Buried the guard in the sand. Bible says your sin will find you out. He got so nervous, so scared, that they was going to find that body. And he flee. He run just as fast as he could run. Got out there, and he thought that he run so far out of anybody wouldn't even know him. He thought he was hiding back in the wilderness, back in the dark, when nobody can find him. Well, I'm here to tell you, you can't run far enough from God. You can't get it so dark that God can't see you. I don't care how fast or how hard you want to run. When you stop, you'll be face to face with him if he's calling him, if he's talking to you. So he's back in the wilderness for another 40 years. He's 80 years old. There's a burning bush over there that gets his extension. He's watching the bush, and the bush ain't burning up. Now it's really got his attention. He wants to get a little closer. Now there's a voice coming out of the bush. And it reminds him. Moses, I don't care where you are. When you talk to the Lord, you're standing on the holy ground. You kick them sneakers off. Because you're standing on the holy ground. So they had that conversation. Lord told them what he wanted Moses to do. Moses said, you got me messed up. He said, don't you understand why I'm out here to start with? And you want me to go back right to the place where I'm running from? You want me to go in there before the king and make a demand before the king? You've got me messed up. You must be smoking crack or something. That 
that excuse didn't float. Well, you know I can't talk good. Again, the Lord has to remind them. All things are possible through me. Didn't I make your stuttering lips? I could sure give you the words to speak it. Excuses. When you run out of excuses, Satan's got plenty more for you. Go set my people free. No church, his people still in bondage. It's us. All through the Bible. You don't have to, you've heard me say it before, you don't have to be incarcerated to be in jail. Being incarcerated is what ends up with us in jail. Moses said, you got me messed up. He said, well, don't you have a, a brother? Got that sly tongue? I said, yeah. He said, how about I just let him do the talking? Well, they ain't going to believe that you sent me. Still making excuses. Lord said, I've called you and I've already prepared the way. I'm not going to send you into battle without giving you the weapons to fight the battle with. We got that tendency to keep running and keep telling the Lord what he wants from us. He already knows what he wants from us. We need to, you know, have that one-way conversation where we're allowed to shut this thing up and open these things up so we can hear what he's saying. Do you ever get some of them people come to you and you ask you for advice and never shut up? Never shut up. I counseled a guy for I don't know how long. Months, months, months. Every time he called me, it was two and a half hour phone conversation. He called for advice and he never shut up. So I hung on the phone for two hours to listen to him. So, All right, brother. said, you need to talk to me and call me back anytime you want to. Finally, he got the point. Because he was never coming out of his battle. He was making his own battle bigger. Because he wouldn't shut that thing up and listen. Sometimes we just got to shut up. Lord's talking to each and every one of us every day. How do I know that? Scripture tells us. <laughs> Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. And I will know them. That brings up the question, if Jesus is not talking to you, if you're not hearing his voice, are you his sheep? Because he's talking every day. Sometimes I've had some pretty good conversations with him. Sometimes it's been a one-sided conversation where I just sit and listen to him. Sometimes he wants that input. He already knows the answer before, you know, he asked the question. But at least he wants us to step up. And had that conversation, that personal relationship that we've got to have. So that's what Moses does. He finally goes down and he does what the Lord tells him to do. And everything works out just the way the Lord tells him it's going to work out. Everything. And then we get so comfortable with what the Lord gives us. Then we start laying out of church. Not coming to God's house. Not showing up for the functions. We have Jesus Fest every year. I went last year. I'm not going this year. I'm going to tell you something right now. I said, you know, it's not the pastor's job to go out amongst the hedges and the highways. It's the pastor's job to be the shepherd. There's no reason in the world where we should have empty seats. We all live in a neighborhood. Well, if you've got neighbors coming to the yard, we should be teaching Jesus to them. We should be going to their yard and preaching Jesus to them. We built that wall for a reason. Brings up another blessing. While we was here the other day, two older ladies pulled up in front of the building out there, motioned me out the door. He says, is this the church? I said, it most certainly is. Well, what's that old nasty dumpster doing in front of the church? I said, we got that old nasty dumpster in there because we're making room for you to sit 
when you come to church. We're moving the wall out. They said, we'll be here Sunday. Lord's already laid everything out. If he didn't lay this wall out this particular week, nobody would have been here to invite those two ladies to church. He's already got everything laid out. All we have to do is just do what he tells us to do. Quit arguing, quit studying. Quit trying to find a way around it. There is no way around it. Jesus said, if you come any other way but through me, you come as a thief and you'll be treated as a thief. Bible talks about thieves and how some of them is going to end up in hell unless they turn away. He's got everything already laid out for us. All we got to do is just show up and do, do what he tells us to do. We've touched on the two pregnant ladies. We've touched on the murder. Now we're going to touch on the thief. The thief's me. It wasn't after I become a member of the Mission Church of God that I was called. I was called to preach as a little boy. And I run so fast. Not know that I was running at the time, but I run so fast. And as I growed up, until a young man, I run even faster because it was prophesied again. I don't want to have nothing to do with it. I'm having too much fun. I'm doing what I want to do. I've done a lot of my jail time as a kid. Right into my early, early years. A lot of my jail time. When I was in jail, we didn't have the program that I'm associated with nowadays. I'm associated with Kentucky Jail Ministry. I'm one of the ministers that go in and witness to the young men and some of the older men that was on the path that I was on when I was running as hard as I could run. Lord will set you down, whether it's in a jail cell or a hospital bed. But at least one time in your life, you'll hear what he's saying to you. That's his promise. You'll hear what he's saying to you. And that's when you, you've got the right to step up and say, yes, Lord, or no, 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 Lord. He should give us the perfect example when he hung on the cross. Everybody is not going to come to the Lord. One thief said, yes, Lord, remember me. The other thief said, I don't want to know anything about you. I'm so thankful tonight that he gave me chance and chance and opportunity after opportunity to hear his voice. Because I run hard, people. I run hard. If you remember my wife, she probably had most of you men stand in for me. Stand up here, be prayed for. When you started out, you didn't know anything about me. But through her, you got to know a little bit about me. And you got to know through the testimonies of the prayer what kind of man I was. I put my hands on her. I cheated on her. And I treated her like a fool. And one day that monster stepped through that door. And you guys got to see me. Some of you was afraid of me. Still running. 
And the Lord tear my heart out of my chest. Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. All you got to do is quit running. But church, I wouldn't change anything that I've done to her. I'm remorseful for what I've done. But everything that I've done, I would be scared to death to change it. Because it wouldn't have had me here. I'm not proud of the way I've treated her. I'm not proud of the things I've done to her. I went from a job making $75,000 a year to nothing. I live better now because of that thing called salvation. <laughs> because I finally stopped running and listened to him talking to me. He said, now I'm running the other way. I'm running just as hard as I can to the Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do today? I can't wait to wake up tomorrow morning. Lord, what do you got in plans for me today? I'm so sick and tired of being sick and tired. When you want that peace and you want that joy, quit running. Stop and listen. Shut your mouth, open your ears up. The Lord's got something for each and every one of you guys in this room. Every one of you. He can't use me. Why? He used a 100-year-old man to impregnate a 90-year-old woman. Are you too old? Ain't nobody in this room touching 100. Are you too old? Are you too slow? Are you not educated enough? Are you too educated? He didn't call Moses when Moses was still in the, in the king's palace. He didn't call Moses because of his education. He didn't call me because of my education. He knew me before I had education. He knew Moses. He knows you. Now it brings me to the you part of the message. We've heard the story about the pool of Bethesda. Angel would come down, stir the water once a year. And if you was one of the lucky ones to get in, you got ill. 38 years old, this man laid there. Jesus come by. Jesus looked at him and said, Why are you still here? Don't you want to be healed? Why are you still here? That's me paraphrasing. Why are you still here? And right off the bat, the dude starts making excuses. I ain't got no manservant to put me in. I ain't got nobody to help me in there. And every time I start to get in, somebody else gets in front of me. Excuses. For 38 years, he laid there. Jack, I'd have been crawling with my teeth if nothing else would have moved. How bad did he want to be healed? Apparently not bad enough. But I'm so thankful today that I know the pool of Bethesda. It don't have to be just one or two a season. He stirs that water every day and he invites us in to step in and whatever healing that we need. I know the pool of Bethesda faithfully. He's faithful all the way down the road. I don't care what kind of headache you wake up with, what kind of hip ache you ache with, what kind of hangnail you got. He's worried about the hangnails too. You know that the Bible says he's worried about the little things. And let me tell you something. The only difference in the sizes is that we make it. I hang now to him. It's just like curing cancer. There's no little big things or no, no big little things to the Lord. The book's been laid out. It's been printed out. It's been printed out in big letters in case you can't read. 
He took that excuse away. The prints are too big. Well, they ain't big enough, so he puts them on audio and video. Took another excuse away from us. Why are we not listening to them? Why are we keep laying beside the pool of Bethesda waiting for somebody else to come along to fix us? He's already come. He's already died on the cross. He's already fixed us. All we have to do is step up and claim it. We get so comfortable with those generational curses, sickness and disease. Why did God do this? Why did God make me sick? Why did God make me so short and fat? Why did God give me cancer? Why did God give me heart disease? Well, I'm here to tell you, God didn't give you none of that. I ain't never heard in all my life where they blamed it on Satan. Satan made me sick. Satan gave me cancer. Satan to keep you out of church if you let him. If you fall through that window, lay on the floor and moan and groan about your fingers and your head and your back, and my brother, my back ain't hurt me right now. He asked me about my back after a while ago. I couldn't hardly move around. God will take care of things that you don't even ask for. But he said there is some things that you have to ask for. He's already got the answer before you've got the problem. Because he knew you before he even made the heavens and the earth. He knew the hair of your head. He knew the clothes and the shoes that you're going to have on your back tonight. All the kind of excuses that we use, we ain't got enough time to do anything for God. God's done everything for us and we ain't got enough time and all he asked for is 10% and we can't even give that to him. 10% out of 24 hours is two hours and 40 minutes. I'm sure if I come to some of your houses, I can find dust on your Bible. There's a particular man in the Bible talks about him praying where he wore holes in the floor where he prayed so much. That should be us. I made a promise to the Lord when I was a young man, 20, 22, 23 years old, when I got saved at Katrina Street. I had four or five pair of pants. I promised the Lord I was going to wear the knees out of them. I never wore the first knee out of the first pair of pants. You think he remembered that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why didn't I do it? Because I kept running. I gave my life to the Lord, and, and what happened? I don't even understand what I've done. I know I had this knock on my heart. I know that he was drawing me to the altar. I give my life to the Lord, and he put my number on the wall. I said, all right, I said, I'm going to go to the next one. No discipleship. I brag on the Mission Church of God, not because I'm a member here, but because of the members here. When I come here, before I come here, they was already discipleshipping me through my wife. I'd be standing in bars, run my hand in my pocket, pull out a prayer cloth. It made no difference what pants or what jacket or what shoes I wore, she had it covered. I still find prayer cloths around the house. Everything that I had, she had it covered. I'd find notes written in my jeans. <laughs> she didn't. And I kept running. I kept running. I knew what them prayer cloths was. I knew what them love letters was. I knew what that knock on my heart was. I'd walk back out there and just order me the, another big drink. I would drink where they'd run out of shot glasses, whiskey glasses. You got to give me time. I got to get some of this washed up. 
I was running so fast. If I'd have only known. If I'd have only known. If I had somebody beat my door down. One of my neighbors walking across the street said, Hey, Dave, let me tell you about this man called Jesus. That's what we got to do. So I'm a big, ugly, scary-looking dude. Knock on a guy's door. He needs Jesus, too. That prostitute that we keep driving down, round about, passing up, talking about her. Let's stop. Introduce her to Jesus. Is that what Jesus did? Are we any better? It's already printed out for us in big, bold letters. Easy. If we get out of our comfort zone. I don't know how many murderers I talk to. I don't talk about who they killed. I don't talk to them about why they killed them. Drug pushers. Drug dealers, junkies. 99 and 9 tenths of the people in jail nowadays is drug related. You're either using, or you're pushing, or you're stealing to support your habit. I told him the other day, I said, you know what? I said, back in the day, we had pride when we was a thief. We had pride when we was a criminal. I was a two-story man. I got to use it again today. But if you was a bank robber, that's what you done, you robbed banks. If you was a safe cracker, that's what you done. He said you didn't cross over in somebody else's neighborhood out of respect. I said, you guys don't eat, respect each other, and you sure don't respect yourself. Because we buy into those generational curses. Had a guy tell me the other day at 15 years old, he was indicted as an adult. And it was the world's fault because he'd done that. World picked on him because he was black. All the definition that he gave me, I would have been black. Every definition he give, I've been there and done that. So I should be black. We bite in to this thing called society. Society tells us, once you're there, once you're in the system, there's nothing that you could do to get out of the system. You're useless. You're never going to amount to nothing. I've got the jailhouse tattoos to tell you. I had a correction officer come to me just not long ago and question me about my jailhouse tattoos. Question me about my jail time. Question me how I get in jail. I answered a call in. I answered a call in. I tried to run from that one too. There's no way I'm stepping back in there voluntarily. Lord, you got me messed up. First time I did when I heard that door close on me, you talking about panic? I had some panic issues. When I step through them doors now, and they're kind of a little hesitant about opening the second door up, I'm thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> they found something. But you know what? Then that peace comes over me. If they put you in here, you won't have to stop at the gate to check in. You know what? I'm okay with that. I'm okay if I never draw another breath of free air. 
I said, if I know that when the doors closed on me, I've got enough Jesus in me where I can step every step that he puts in front of me. If that's the calling that he puts on me, I'm okay with that. So if you're one of the ones laying next to the pool of Bethesda, laying there waiting for somebody else to come along to give you a little kick, give you a little nudge, I'm him. I'll nudge you. I'll kick you. I'll hold you under. When you come up, I'll ask you, do you know him yet? Reminds me of a joke that I heard just the other day. A bunch of pastors, they're down at the river. They're baptizing. They're bringing the people up. Did you find Jesus? Oh, yeah, I found Jesus. I found Jesus. Next one they get, they held him under, bring him up, said, you find Jesus? Oh, yeah, I found Jesus. They baptized probably about 150 of them. There's no drunk standing over in the corner. He finally walked over and said, hey, what are you guys doing? He said, well, we're baptizing making sure everybody finds Jesus. They said, well, do you want to be baptized? He said, I sure enough do. So they got him out there, and they held him down. They brought him back up, said, did you find Jesus? He said, no. They took him back down again. They'd done that five or six times. They said, every time he come up, they said, did you find Jesus? He said, are you sure this is where you lost him? <laughs> but that's what we have to do. Those drunks, those drug addicts, those prostitutes. We need to stop. I'm going to take you to Paul. We need to stop. You know, Jesus says, no, no greater friend is to lay down your life for your brother. What does that mean? Does that mean that you actually have to lose your physical life? No. <laughs> says but you do have to put your life on hold to go out and do what I've told you to do because when you put your life on hold I man that's when the blessings start flowing I rush out of here Sunday mornings and get down to jail because I gotta be in jail by one o'clock and man we've been having church That's when the blessings flow. <laughs> when you forget about this guy right here. When you quit putting yourself first. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care. God's already got the answer. Forget about yourself. <laughs> Worry about your brother. If he knows the Lord, if even if she knows the Lord, get her closer. Quit worrying about this guy. The Lord said, I've called you. I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. I'm going to open up the altars. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, come on down. We're going to introduce you. If you want that closer walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, come on down. And he'll let that happen. If you lay him by that pool of Bethesda, it's time to get up and get wet. sick and tired of being sick and tired come on down we got to get out of this comfort zone where the only thing that matters is inside these four walls that wall's got a lot of blemishes on it Jesus said he's coming back for a church without blemish heaven because he stole 
or because he cheated or because he lied. He got kicked out of heaven for being disobedient, for being a rebel. When you don't answer God's call, you're disobedient. That disobedience will send you to hell. It'll send you to hell. Church, I'm asking you tonight, don't be disobedient. If you don't have anybody else to pray for, you pray for me because I need it every day.
sometimes me and electronics don't work, so I don't know if I turned it off or so. How many of y'all glad you came today? Amen. You know, the Bible talks about stirring up the spirit that's inside of you. It talks about waking, waking up. You know, so it's easy sometimes to become complacent and not really realize that you've become complacent. You know, we get real comfortable in taking the same way to work every day or we get into a routine, you know, where we do the same thing over and over and over again because it becomes comfortable for us and it's a safety feature that is built into us. But when you're like that, when you're in that comfort zone, we have a tendency to not look around. Does that make sense? We have a tendency because I know the way I can walk through my living room in the middle of the night with the lights off, Marco, and I don't need anything. You know, we have a tendency not to worry about the lights because I know that where it's at or whatever it is. It's the same way. Sometimes we take the we get used to the same way of going home all the time. And after a while, you see the same things, and you know where the kind of where the dangers lie. Where kind of like where he lives, and a lot of times you got deers coming out. It's usually the same rough area. So over a period of time, what happens is, is we know to look there. But in those other places, we speed up. We figure we can make some time because I know this place. And what happens is, is we forget to look around. And that's where we make our mistakes. We become complacent. We get comfortable from that way home. Sometimes I like to take different ways home just to figure out how many ways I can get home. Why? Because makes you have to look around. It makes you have to realize that I have to see what's going on. Because it's really easy for us to, to stay in that really comfortable, fast way home so that we can do those things. But when something upsets our apple cart and we got to figure another way home, man, our world gets turned upside down. It's amazing what a few yellow cones or orange cones can do to a person. See, Carol's been there. I'm just saying, just saying. You know, sometimes we get orange cones in our life. God puts those there so we can see those people around us that may need help or for whatever reason that He does. We call them divine appointments as ministers. God says, I just want you to love on people and tell people about me. Let everyone stand. I'll say it like this. The Lord did an awesome job through Dave. Amen. If you don't have his phone number, you need to get it because if you're feeling down or a little jaded by this world, it doesn't take you too long talking to Dave to be uplifted. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this awesome day. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of being with these people, your children. Lord, I ask you to go with each and every one of them. Lord, give them a divine appointment, someone that they can ask to church, tell about Jesus. Lord, and bring them back Sunday. Bring them back enthusiastic. Bring, let them bring somebody with them. Lord, and if we just simply lift up Jesus, the Bible says that all men would be drawn unto repentance. Lord, help us to lift up Jesus just a little bit higher with every step we take. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Hug some necks and tell people you're glad to be here. I'm sorry. Come on up, Shelly. Can we uh, get some people that know how to pray? Shelly wants prayer.